In today's Yahoo Finance Playbook, we're taking a look at how investors should best position themselves in emerging markets. With three cuts from the Fed still on the table in the year ahead, global economies could get a boost from easing U.S. monetary policy. But geopolitical risks and loaded election calendars, they may pose potential headwinds in the near term. Here to discuss more is Timothy Ash, Blue Bay's emerging markets sovereign strategist at RBC Global Asset Management, and Anthony Sassin, Crane Chair Senior Investment Strategist. And Tim, let me begin with you. What, what's the state of emerging markets here with the Fed on pause, but having ra raised interest rates in the U.S. to levels that are far, uh, at least the, hard, the, excuse me, the highest here in about 40 years and far surpassing that, what we're seeing in many even developing economies around the world. What is the state of emerging markets here? Well, to be honest, a lot of the bottom-up stories are beginning to turn around. We've had successful debt restructuring in Zambia, there's hopes about Sri Lanka. A lot of, you mentioned geopolitical risks, obviously lots of concerns about the Middle East, but there've been some beneficiaries. Egypt got a huge financing package. Uh, we're seeing a lot of people go into local Egypt rates and FX. Uh, we're seeing Turkey turn around in the you know, orthodox monetary policy kind of story. Argentina, again, I mean, people are kind of giving up on Argentina, given all the debt restructurings. You know, we have a president who's, who's pushing on with a reform agenda, South Africa, you mentioned elections. Uh, again, markets traded off. That's created opportunities if the worst doesn't happen in South Africa and we get um, uh, Cyril uh, Ramaphosa uh, securing another term and maybe doing an alliance uh, with uh, more reform-minded parties. So, you know, there are a lot of bottom up interesting stories. And, and that seems to be the major theme rather than the kind of rate story. Mm -hmm. Anthony, I want, to, I want to bring you in here as well. And likewise, kind of start with your high-level view uh, here, Anthony. We, we obviously talk a lot about the U.S. on this show, but you know, we shouldn't forget emerging markets. Are, are they, broadly speaking, Anthony, um, are you bullish? Do they look poised to outperform here? I mean, I'm, I, I, I advise investors to always have an emerging markets exposure, but if you look at it in the short term, uh, I definitely think it's very well positioned to do well in the next three to five years, given where we are in valuation and growth, and given the individual stories that you have from one country to another, uh, starting with China, which has been struggling a little bit over the past two years because of COVID regulation and consumer sentiment, but that's gonna come back, valuations very low. Going to Korea, South Korea and Taiwan, where the AI uh, craze is really taking hold right now, and and continues to, to exceed expectations, or going to even Brazil, which is very cheap, or even looking at the GCC with countries like Saudi Arabia and UAE, where you have really major top-down reforms that are truly ambitious and, and driving growth for multiple years. So looking at emerging markets today, where valuation is uh, compared to S&P 500, close to 20, 30% uh, discount, and the growth prospect for uh, for the next three to five years, I'm, I'm very comfortable uh, saying that it has a good probability of outperformance. And Tim, uh, we were just talking about Brazil real quickly, but I want to focus in on Latin America. Um, I, from memory, Brazil was one of the first emerging markets to raise rates way back in 2021, something around there ahead of the game, and that got them ahead. Uh, where are Where is Brazil right now and some of the other uh, economies in Latin America? How have they adapted to the world interest rate structure that's kind of been dominated by the U.S.? Well, you're right. I mean, a lot of Latin America, but actually also Central Europe, um, was very preemptive, or proactive, I should say, in terms of raising rates, given the inflation shock. Uh, now we're seeing inflation moderate pretty quickly. That's allowing central banks to cut rates or have cut rates. Uh, and obviously, that's that's great for fixed income space. Uh, it's, it's helping confidence more generally. Um, so we've got a, a good group of countries that I think are doing the right thing in terms of policy. I mentioned Turkey there. Massive transformation in that story. Remember Erdogan uh, with a you know massively negative interest rates, currency crisis, currency pressures. You know they're they're now one of the standouts. I mean they really massively raised rates to fifty percent. We're hopeful of a turnaround story there uh, after these local elections that are coming up. So you know a year ago, two years ago, you know the bottom up stories were terrible across emerging markets, and you know we've seen an, an incredible transformation because of a combination of different factors. You know, the peculiarities in the individual countries, the geopolitics, as I mentioned, that kind of played out relatively well for certain credits. Again, Egypt, bailout, Pakistan also succeeded in getting a bailout. 
Um, but you know, it's a it's a, and it actually performance certainly in fixed mm-hmm. income space has been pretty strong in, in the last six months or so. Anthony, I want to bring you back here as well. Talk a little bit more about China. You know, it's interesting, Anthony. You know, I, I think we've had a, a number of strategists on the show, and I think generally they you know, feel like they're kind of steering clear of China, just given the shaky economy there, Anthony, and geopolitical tensions. You know the reasons. Um, I'm interested, when you, when you look at China, where specifically do you see value, Anthony? Are there, are there certain sectors, industries? I mean, I, I see value in China across the board, uh, but mostly in the industries and sectors that are uh, in the government's plan for the future, right? So what I want to look at, at China, I'm looking at the internet economy, which is the engine for tra- transmission engine for consumption, which is also uh, the place where, where most of the new grads find their first jobs. Uh, it is the industry that employs most of the engineers and, and the business uh, management uh, uh, new grads. Also looking at, at uh, clean energy, right? It's Which is a big uh, part of China's policy today, whether uh, solar or electric vehicles. Um, healthcare now, we're starting to hear rumbles that that uh, that Chinese the Chinese government is going to start supporting the biotechnology industry, uh, which is uh, related to innovative drugs. That could uh, open up uh, a whole opportunity for these companies, you know, because China's really uh, uh, patients or citizens are very underserved, especially when it comes to sophisticated diseases. But if you look at China, there's innovation across the board. There's growth across the board. It's just the consumer sentiment that is still a little bit depressed and needs to come back. 30 seconds, real quick here, Anthony, uh, should China even be considered an emerging market given its size and whatever other reasons? Uh, Absolutely, it is an emerging market, but we look at it very differently as a different asset class, especially when you compare it to emerging markets ex China. Emerging markets ex China tend to be a lot more correlated with US rates and inflation. China is not. China is much more broad uh, in terms of innovation. Uh, We believe if you break down the two, you're able to generate better alpha and emerging markets and manage your risk much better. All right, got to leave it there. Really appreciate both of you, Tim and Anthony, for stopping by here.